Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenicast. We have a great episode for you this week. Rajiv and Bonnie sat down with the Reverend Dr. Horace L. Griffin. It is a wonderful conversation, but before we get into that, we have a special announcement. Uh, things here at Irenicast are going really well. We're getting great feedback from all of you. We're growing. We're seeing a lot of great things happen, and we have a lot of great things planned. And one of the ways that we hope to accomplish some of the things coming up in the future for the show is we want to enlist a team, a street team, so to speak, of listeners to help us help give us feedback who have specific talents in either social media or graphic design or or whatever, whatever you think you could bring to the show, even just simply sharing on a regular basis episodes that come out. Uh, we have a lot of things that we want to go over. So what we're going to do is on September 22nd at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we are going to have like a, I don't know, a webinar or a, a special Zoom meeting with people who might be interested in being on this particular team. So if that is you, this is how you can be involved. You can email us at podcast at irenicast.com and in the subject line just put street team that's podcast at irenicast.com uh, it's going to be a limited commitment but when we have the webinar on the 22nd we're going to kind of go over some of the details and get some feedback and opinions on that so if you're interested in being a part of that if you've been a regular listener to the show or you're just a brand new listener to the show and you'd like to be more involved in the process, get involved in a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff that happened here at Irenicast. We would love to have you. Uh, there's no commitment other than just coming to the webinar and seeing what we're presenting and what we're going to be talking about. So again, email us if you're interested, podcast at irenicast.com and put street team in the subject line. We'll be talking more about this as we approach that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Hope to hear from all of you soon. So in regard to today's episode, it is a wonderful episode. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but I will say this. Uh, everything that they talk about in the episode, go to irenicast.com slash 149. That's our show notes, and that'll have all the information about this particular episode. But more importantly, it'll have the links to this episode. The Reverend Dr. Horace L. Griffin is a wealth of knowledge. And just listening to this conversation, he knows so much, and he's dropping all these names in liberation theology and black church history and church history. It is a 101 course on just church history in America in general. So I encourage you to take advantage of the show notes, especially for this particular episode, and start a deep dive into all the voices and names that he mentions in this particular episode. It is it is a wonderful conversation that they sit down and have. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go on assignment. And without any further ado, here is this week's episode with the Reverend Dr. Horace L. Griffin. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Arenacast. This is Rajiv. I'm Bonnie. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. Jeff, Alan, and Casey are on assignment somewhere doing some things. This week, Bonnie and I have the pleasure and honor of conversing with a dear friend, former neighbor, <laughs> author, <laughs> professor, priest, and inspirational leader, the Reverend Dr. Horace Griffin. Welcome to our Renicast. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Bonnie, for having me. It's really good to be here. Yeah, we're so excited. It's been a long time since we've seen our good friend um, Horace, and so it's it's a delight to sit across the table from you and talk about things that we care about, like theology. <laughs> yes. So many things, so many things. But to start with, uh, Horace, would you mind giving us maybe a, a thumbnail sketch of your journey? Sure. A long journey here. I grew up in a very conservative um, part of the country and part of the state of Florida, uh, North Florida. And I grew up there with uh, my father being a Pentecostal minister and mother uh, attended the Baptist church. And that's where I was nurtured, in Ebenezer Baptist Church in Stark, Florida. And that's where I learned about faith. And it gave me that foundation. So I always talk about how much I celebrate the black church and that nurture that I received that helped me deal with the racism of the culture, the racism of the times, and how I was celebrated and praised 
as a young African American because God had made me and that I was God's own. And that was really, really great. However, as I grew older and began to recognize my gayness as a youth, it was very troubling because those were the same messages that I had received that I was not okay. So I was okay as an African-American, but I was condemned as a gay man that this was not pleasing to God and that I was hell bound. So I really struggled for a long time and went through a lot of turmoil going through the, the changes of dating young women to make myself what they said I had to be, even though I was not authentic. It was not how God made me. So I later went through high school, went into ministry young, and went to Morehouse College in Atlanta in 1979. And it was there that I began to wrestle even more with my sexual identity. Well, at the time, I felt that God had delivered me from homosexuality through much prayer, because that's what I was taught. So I went through much repression. I can say it's repression now. And it really is the fundamentalist nature that so many young and old people, older people struggle with because of wanting to be faithful to their theology and to the church, their faith community, while at the same time, knowing that there is something not true to how they are living. So I was, all of this was going on in this 18 year old body as I started Morehouse. And so the way I dealt with it was to strongly oppose homosexuality. I was on the campus and I did a lot of preaching against homosexuality in the chapel. I wrote letters in the school newspaper against homosexuality. To, the, to my chagrin, there were a number of gay, young gay men who did not share my views that homosexuality was sinful. And even many of them, I think of that time, felt that they were not quite right. Those who were in the church, they still felt that this was not something that I should preach against. I remember when I was in my first year at Morehouse, there was a young man from New York, uh, and I still remember his name. His name is Reggie. And he was very, uh, I hate to use this term, but I'm going to use it because it describes him flamboyant. He was very, in, in very stereotypical ways, gay. And so I felt that he was a great target to witness to him, to change him from being gay. And so I went to his room with my Bible, expecting that I would find a young man tormented with his homosexuality, as I was years earlier. And he was not having it. He was very comfortable with himself. He admitted that he was gay and said he always knew that he was gay. And when he was a little boy, he preferred pink over blue. And it was all of this stuff that just blew my mind because I had not experienced anyone who would first admit that he was gay and not trying to change it and to be okay with it. Um, and so I went away bewildered that he would not have wanted me to pray and deliver, quote unquote, deliver him from homosexuality. So that was really my college time of much struggle. Through all my four years, I struggled and never got the help that I needed to find, to be able to reconcile my Christianity with my sexual orientation as gay. There were professors who were gay, but this was a culture where we didn't have a national conversation. We did not have the resources. We did not have the thinking that we have today, that we've made a lot more progress 40 years later. So that was where I was on that journey. 
And then um, what really helped me was going to seminary to begin to unpack how the Bible had been construed to condemn gays and lesbians in a similar way as it has subjugated women and it has condemned or or justified the uh, subordination of African-Americans and slavery and justified slavery and segregation through using texts. So that was the first part of my journey. And I can share more about what led me to writing this book. You know, your story to me has echoes of Paul, where you're out there persecuting some of God's children, which deep down you were subject of that persecution. Yes. So did you have a singular or a series of seminal moments like Paul did that opened your eyes and your heart to a different way? I finally got to the point to recognize my gay identity after Morehouse, the summer after Morehouse. Oh, I met an older Morehouse man who was in Atlanta for a conference, and he introduced himself. I was in the dining hall, and what became a line was, how is Morehouse these days? And, and I was really taken by his intellect, his physical appearance, and his personality. So I went later to his apartment and we continued to talk and have a a really fun time. And later that day, I remember this strong attraction toward him, which, which troubled me. And he responded to what became pretty apparent that I was physically attracted to him. And at that moment I struggled and I felt what's, well, I was saying to myself what's happening. And I thought these feelings that are going on are just feelings that are coming from the devil. I put them, it was all in, in these theological terms, because I still struggled and felt the homosexuality was sinful at the time. And I felt that as long as I did not have sex with him or did not reach orgasm, that I was still okay. Unfortunately, that things led, one thing led to another. And eventually um, I did reach orgasm later that night. And At that point, I'm pretty sure I was suicidal because I felt all the writings, the sermons, the conversations, all of those things that I had worked so hard all my life to say that this was not right and those people were not right with God, that it all came back on me, that I was one of those people. And fortunately, his maturity Uh, helped me through that period. And this weekend, that weekend turned out to be an absolute wonderful, wonderful weekend that I shared my body with this man. And the only way I could make peace with it was that I cast the experience in the context of Jesus coming to see me. That's the only way it could I could make sense of it because I felt this was something that was so good and had made me so whole that it had to be a spiritual experience. And so that left me feeling very good, but also very confused because I still had not reconciled homosexuality as a legitimate gift from God, a sexual gift from God with my faith. So that was perplexing. That fall, I started Boston University School of Theology. And it was going to seminary, as I said, making the connections with how Scripture had been used to justify the demonization of a group of people 
In a similar way, other groups have been demonized. And through my study at Boston, by the time I graduated, even though I took some time off because I, sh I was struggling with my gayness, and then there was a car accident that became of spiritual awakening. I felt so low emotionally that I didn't want to continue to live in that state of this is who I am. I did not choose to be gay. I did not. And I prayed actually not to be gay, but I was gay. So having to carry that with me and not having anyone to go to, not having clergy I could with whom I could talk to, other Christians in the church with whom I could speak. So I carried this by myself. And then after the accident, the Spirit spoke to me at Piedmont Hospital and asked me, is this what you want when I come close to death? And at that point, I said to God that I did not want to die. I was too young to die. I wanted to leave a contribution to the world before dying. And it was at that point that I said that I would never let anyone make me feel less than human again. And I went back. It was a literally a turning point and figuratively. I went back to Boston, finished the next year or 88. And then I went into the PhD program at Vanderbilt, came out the next year in April 15th, 1989 at a metropolitan community church. Uh, there was a coming out event at the church in Nashville. And I gave my story very nervous. First time I was publicly sharing my story as I'm doing now. And it was at that point that it was really a turning point in my journey to be able to not only acknowledge my gayness, but to embrace and celebrate how God had made me and wanting to give witness to that. Hmm. That's Thank you for sharing that story. Powerful. I think a lot of our listeners actually can can relate to um, a lot of what you're of what you said, Horace. Um, there was a recent study out saying that for straight people who ha say religious religion is really important, that provides a protective factor against suicidal ideation. But for gay and lesbian youth, especially, who say that religion is important to them, they're they're 38 percent more likely to have um, suicidal thoughts than their their straight counterparts. You know, we've we've heard from we've heard from folks who listen to the podcast about their own stories and, and journeys with um, the struggle to reconcile their faith with uh thoughts of suicide and, you know, and their gayness. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I experienced both sides of that. It was my faith that really took me into that very dark place and feeling very, very lonely and feeling very much unworthy. But it was also my faith that kept me and by belief in God, that God loved me and cared for me. It was the church that had veered far from what the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches, which is to uh, love yourself and that I have been made whole and that I'm not condemned in Jesus, that it was a, it's a gospel of love and liberation. So I was eventually able to get to that point through people like Paul Tucker at Metropolitan Community Church and reading about Troy Perry and hearing stories of other gay and lesbian Christians at Vanderbilt that I was eventually able to get back to my foundation. Uh, even though I still, the institution, I had a lot of pain and I, I think that's why I do this work because there was a lot of pain, and I think about that, the pain that so many people carry, the spiritual abuse that so many 
young people and others experience because the messages that they hear from the churches that they are not right with God. And so I'm very clear that God gave me this ministry to be able to give voice to those people who struggle to let them know that God celebrates who they are and that their sexuality is a gift from God and that there is nothing wrong with them. And just like other issues in history, it has taken a long time for us to get to this place. But thanks be to God that we have people who are now rising up, not only LGBTQI and other alphabets of people who have found this presence of God or faith in their lives, but many heterosexual allies, as you all are, in this uh, this struggle to continue to move us toward the beloved community and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I love how you articulated the realization that you came to that it wasn't God and it wasn't you. It was the church that had made the mistake mm-hmm. and that God loved you. And, and that is a message that you know, and, and you've worked with countless people who spent too many years not knowing that. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there is good news. There is good news. And a lot of that good news is in your book. The book titled Their Own Receive Them Not, African American Lesbians and Gays in Black Churches. And I highly commend this book to anybody who has not read it. It has changed people's lives. Um, it's changed my life. And uh, thank you for for writing it and for taking your story and the pain that you experienced and turning it into a ministry. It reads like a love letter to me, to, oh. to Black Church. Oh. Has anybody well, said that before no. to you? No, say more. I'm interested. That, that the nurture that you, you lift up. I see the, the I read the, in your early stories of what it was like to grow up in this community where you were lifted up and held up and it was a safe space from the racism and the rest of the world. And, and then the pain of not being able to, to stay, Mm. but, but loving what you got. I I don't, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, you know, it's amazing that I think you're right. I think it is love because when you love, a family member or you love uh, someone in the community or you love an institution, you are connected to it. It doesn't mean that you just say the nice things about it when nice things don't need to be said, but that you are engaged in a way that you want it to do better. And Donna Allen, who's a minister in the Bay area at a panel that discussed my book shortly after it was published, she said, you love the black church. And, and I, I was, it, I was taken aback about it a little uh, by that statement because I, I think I provide a pretty strong critique of the black church on this issue. But she said, you love the church, the black church, because if you didn't care about it, you would just kind of like, kind of like the hell with it and move on. But because you are engaged and you want it to be what you know it can be, you have put your passion and your soul behind it. And that's love. So I guess in a love letter, I guess that's another way of saying it. Because if you have passion and you care about someone, then those feelings come forth Mm -hmm. in a writing. Like the way Jesus loved, like, you know, calling people (laughs) out, (laughs) but with the hope that they could be better. Yeah, I I think I think that's right. It has changed people's lives. One of my dear friends is the Reverend Kimberly Jackson, who is an Episcopal priest, uh, African-American lesbian, who came up to me when I spoke at Emory 11 years ago. And she talked about, she came up to me and thanked me. She said, Dr. Griffin, thank you for writing this book. It's changed my life. And it enabled me to come out as lesbian to my parents. 
and her family has not been there with her. And it's been a very painful journey for her. But she and her wife, Trina, uh, live in Atlanta, and I get to see her fairly frequently. We just finished a Lenten series together. And I pray for her parents, and I hope one day that she will be able to witness the love that she and Trina deserve, and that they can rise above the sin and evil of homophobia and heterosupremacy that I write about in the book. Um, James Baldwin says, he talks about something being wrong with religion when it divides people and causes so much pain and heartache to those people we love in the name of God. I remember when you all know Proposition 8 was happening out here, and there was a mother who got on the witness stand in support of Proposition 8 and said that if she knew that her son would be gay, she would have aborted him. And I think of that, that hate, that what has been taught by the church, that she could feel that way about her own flesh and blood, about the the child she delivered and the gift that God gave her and that she could see that her child is so unworthy. Um, it's very painful. So those stories are out there and we are committed. I am committed as long as there's breath in my body to be able to speak against that evil of homophobia that will cause a parent to say that about her child. Mm -hmm. You know, the first printing was 2006, right? Yes. And you're in your third printing now, you said? That is correct. That's fabulous. Well, thank you. It is, I have longed for other books to follow. And that was what I, you may remember reading that, that I, I hope that would be just the first of many books that would be written on the subject. And even to go farther, because I don't really deal with bisexuality and transgenderism in this book that has become more a present with us now in the culture. And unfortunately, we don't have the work out there coming from those who are, have gone through the black church. And I understand, I understand why as much as I want it, I understand why this was an especially painful yeah. uh, process. Hmm. Has anything changed? What What's changed within the black church since you wrote the book? I, from where I sit and I am engaged with different people who are uh, connected with me, um, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Martin Luther King's Church. Uh, we have had a partnership. We at St. Luke's Episcopal Church, where I serve as associate priest of, for pastoral care and uh, outreach. We've done things with our youth. Uh, there was a program, which is wonderful. St. Luke's and Ebenezer went into partnership to help children who were coming from poor families to, it was called I Have a Dream, and it's a national program where young people or kids are supported financially. Uh, they receive mentoring to stay in school, get an education, to graduate from high school, which in many communities, that's a big, big accomplishment. And the program was 17 years long. So they tracked kids from elementary school all the way through high school and college. And you saw some who had come through. One young man is going to Vanderbilt's Law School. And it was just great to see. So there have been churches uh, that have been, I've been connected in that way. But on the issue around sexuality and homosexuality in particular, black churches, and I can speak pretty broadly here, still struggle mightily with changing theology, looking at lesbians and gays, the moral aspects. Some will support the civil rights aspect that gays and lesbians should be able to get housing to be able to find employment. But when it comes to morality, whether the love between two men or love between two women is a legitimate, celebrated, moral place of being with God, 
that's where you have a big struggle and little has changed from the writing of this book 13 years ago. I know that there is some movement with younger people, millennials. I think that there is from so much resistance that my generation of boomers created. I do think that there is an, a softening, if not advocacy, at least silence or indifference. And as small as that is, it is a step, a baby step, but a step. Mm -hmm. In your book, you draw from Black liberation theology as a foundation for dismantling homophobia. And I wonder, could you say a little bit more about that? Yes. Understanding liberation theology, if you go into any of the liberation theologies, whether it's Gustavo Gutierrez in Latin American liberation theology or Rosemary Radford Ruther and other feminist liberation theologians or James Cone, Dwight Hopkins um, on black liberation theology and all the womanist theologians, Katie Cannon, Dolores Williams, Jacqueline Grant and others. Then if you read liberation theology that is based in Luke four eighteen nineteen. 19, of Jesus coming to deliver their press, to set the captives free, then when you really understand that liberation, it is a paradox. It is antithetical to the very premise if you are promoting a theology that is ultimately causing people to live with oppression, the oppression of themselves the denial of who they are when they are wanting to be authentic as God made them. And when you think about what makes people whole, we are sexual beings and our sexuality is our wholeness. And to deny that in a person does not allow them to be whole as God has made them. So it is it, it is inconsistent with liberation theology and the very definition of it to make a claim that you are for liberation theology when you are working on a theology that undermines one's own personhood and being. It, um, one of the co-hosts here on Arenacast, um, Casey, Pastor Casey Tennant, was a student of uh, Horace's at Pacific School of Religion, and um, he shared his story also on the podcast. And so I'm, I'm sure our listeners, from what you just talked about, they can hear threads of <laughs> of your teaching and what he was sharing. I'd, I'd like to take a slightly different turn because you're. You're an ordained and established priest in the Episcopal Church. You're a black man in a very white denomination. Yes. Although we have a black presiding bishop. <laughs> All right. <now. laughs> so talk a little bit about that experience. I, I, you know, I'm in the UCC. We've had our, you know, our fun verbal battles over that as brothers, um, which is also a very white denomination. Yes, it is. Um, I think there's one other Indian clergy in the UCC. There might be more. So talk a little bit about what that's like to have found a home in a denomination that has a checkered history with race, to say it mildly. Yes. But you're there and doing incredible work. Just talk a little bit about that. Well, you're right to raise that. It is a bit ironic that I would, as much as I was committed and, and worked in black church settings and, and did so much work in ministry for years and years, um, my early years. Um, and it planned to have a career or ministry, a vocation in the black church for me to be so active now in a white denomination that is very white. And I, as you were talking, I was thinking about often we go in places expecting that those who are closest to us will be the ones who will embrace us and celebrate us and love us. And unfortunately, you, it's not just this issue, but you can pick your issue. Many people talk about their family members not being there for them many times. Uh, your co-colleagues, 
on in your professions. And then you find people or even moving to places where you think these people are not going to be here. And then you go to places where you think that that you will find that support and you don't. So I think the Episcopal Church was one of those places where I never thought that I would find so much love, so much affirmation and celebration of who I am. And I have, and I do love the Episcopal Church. I was thinking of Barbara Clementine Harris, who became the first woman to be consecrated as bishop in the Episcopal Church in the Anglican Communion, an African-American woman. So it was the white church that lifted up a black woman before any of the black historically black denominations would uh, consecrate, uh, ordain a black woman bishop. The first was in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 2000, Vashti McKenzie. So I think that in one way of looking at it, yes, it may be ironic, but on another level, when your own will not receive you, there are others who are there to receive you, and it kind of shifts how you think of your own. I have found uh, much support. I have a ministry with integrity that I can be who I am and who God made me to be. And I've been able to have that ministry. And I've seen people come in and go through transformation, uh, just listening to my ministry and others. And so I think it has been a very um, good place for me, a very good home. And there are many Black Episcopalians and others who who need a voice uh, on race. And I work on the racism in the Episcopal Church because it is there. And um, the challenge to, whether it's sexism or misogyny or racism or all of the, the isms, I am committed to that work. And it's, it's wherever we go. So I, f- I find that I have much work to do there um, and can do it and that I'm needed there as well. Um, I think that's actually leads into another question. And, and you reference seminary as being kind of that foundational piece for where theology maybe shifted for you or through Bible study, you realized how texts were being used in really wrong ways. But you love Christianity. You know, that's one of the things I love about being in relationship with you is that you're you're a walking gospel, really, in many mm. ways. You just embrace it so fully. And not just, you know, I think a lot of our listeners are thinking about they're leaving evangelical or fundamentalist traditions for all kinds of reasons. And many times, though, they want to take Jesus and the gospel with them. Yes. Maybe if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about your love for Christianity, but also how you were able to stay in institutional Christianity. Yes. So thank you for the questions. Uh, Great. I grew up, as I mentioned, in a fundamentalist environment. And over time, I've come to learn that it's not baby with the bathwater. And I went through my own struggles with the institution. I left the church for almost 10 years because I didn't know of another way. I didn't know about the Episcopal Church. I didn't know about the United Church of Christ. I did not know about Lutheran Church and some of the more uh, progressive, even outside of the mainstream uh, churches, Unitarian or uh, the or Quakers and progressive movements that allow for us to celebrate and and embrace our faith and actually honor the gospel in a way that I did not do not think that it was being honored when I was beating up people with the bible i really don't this punitive god i i know there is a strong strain of it in this particularly in this culture, fundamentalism is strongest in this in this country more than any of the other industrialized countries in the Western world. And fundamentalism, I heard Jeremiah Wright preach about fundamentalism is the problem in any of the religions, whether it's, it's Judaism or Islam or Christianity. And I was able to separate the bad religion from the good religion and was able to 
to get there through prayer, uh, just praying to God and and staying there and not giving up on the church. And I'm all I come out as a Christian because I think it's important for people to see that I there are other kinds of Christians that Pat Robertson does not speak for all Christians. Thank be to God. Amen. <laughs> and that there are other voices and faces like the most Reverend Michael B. Curry, who talks about the Jesus movement and that the Episcopal Church is just the, the, the Episcopal arm of the Jesus movement. And he talks about loving like Jesus. And he's been saying that throughout his Episcopate as well as his, uh, his time as presiding bishop. And I really think that that is what we have to push. We have to push the love of Jesus Christ. And it is not found with a mother saying, I would abort my gay son. That is not the love of Jesus. It is not the love of Jesus of the Westboro Baptist Church protesting at Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark Colleges, Clark Atlanta University, uh, those institutions, because they are opening space for transgender folks and how God has the, the great mosaic of who we are as human beings. So that is not of God. And it doesn't mean that anything goes. Often when people hear me, they, they think I'm saying anything goes. I'm not. I do believe in sin. And I think sin is anything that causes one to abuse others or abuse oneself. It is anything that takes away when we look at whether it's rape or it's robbery or murder, when you cause harm to others, when you cause harm to yourself, those are things that make sin. But when you are loving another human being, when you are in relationship and bring compassion and care and wholeness, God is everything to do with that. I just did a wedding of two men and I talked about angels rejoicing uh, with that love that is shared between these two men, that their witness to each other in my office brought me to tears when I felt the power of their love. And that is God, because God is love. And so that is the Christianity, that is the part of the church that I carry, and many people carry. Unfortunately, we don't often hear those stories because the media doesn't focus on that part of Christianity enough. And we have some of the same voices. And I think the worst voices often in the church that turn so many people away, particularly millennials, as Bishop Curry said when he spoke at St. Luke's a little over a year ago, that a lot of millennials are not coming to the institutional church because they feel feel that we, and there's a painting with a broad brush, that we are spiteful, that we are mean-spirited, and that we are hateful, and their understanding of God is not that. So they're saying, why should I go to an institution that is not reflective of the love of God? So, so I'm trying to let them know that I'm in the church I will be in the church until I'm called home to be with the Lord, because I believe that there is much good in the Christian church. And St. Luke's Episcopal Church is doing the, the Luke 4 and 18, 19, that we, we have welcomed all of God's people. We just started a homeless, uh, a school for homeless children that they can come and everything is supported. It's all paid for that. They can have a future that they that more than they could have imagined in their in living in shelters or living on the streets. We feed through our Crossroads ministry. We feed hundreds of folks every week. Uh, we provide clothing. We provide a uh, job training. We provide uh, for veterans that we have uh, support for them so that they can get employment. So, I mean, I feel that is what, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 25. When did you do it to me? If you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So that is the Christianity. That is the church that I hold up. Hmm. It's beautiful. Really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And with people with people like you committed 
to leveraging the power of the institutional church gives me hope as somebody who gave up on one in a previous life mm-hmm. um, and has found another in in this rebirth, I guess, um, which has also been a, a safe haven. So thank you for that commitment and dedication and, and being willing to, to step into spaces that uh, a lot f- for being out <laughs> as a, a love fueled Christian priest. Yes. It, it means a lot. So I want to I want to shift gears a little. Bit. Go right ahead. You are a fan of first ladies. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> and so I just want to ask you a few questions because I think that is such a cool <laughs> hobby. I, I have a lot of friends with lots of varied interests. You are you are one of my nearest and dearest friends. And you're the only one who loves first ladies as much <laughs> as you love first ladies. So. First question. This should be an easy one, maybe. But who's your favorite and why? Oh, it is an easy one. I'm reading her a, a, a biography of her now and her relationship with her female partner, Eleanor Roosevelt. And it is um, a book I have upstairs or downstairs uh, here. And it is the letters that Lorena Hickok and Eleanor Roosevelt exchanged over years People like Doris Kearns Goodwin have written and have talked about what has now become public knowledge that she and President Roosevelt had their partners uh, outside of their marriage or alongside their marriage, I should say. And they worked out when we talk about how we have different configurations of family. There was a certainly a a configuration of family that went beyond just the two of them. And some of the struggles, if they lived in our time, there might've been different choices made. Um, I'm not saying everything that happened in, in that those relationships were always honorable, particularly from president Roosevelt's standpoint. But I do think that reading about her and just her, being ahead of her time in a number of ways, her speaking out against the racism, um, speaking for women's issues and wanting to have space for women, whether it's news reporters or that would follow the, do the reporting, making a space and or speaking out for women and, and women having a place that was more equal to men um, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s and to early sixties before her death. So she, she rises to the top. Uh, I like a lot of, I mean, there, there are some close seconds and Michelle Obama, Robinson Obama would be uh, a close second, but given the breadth of what Eleanor Roosevelt was able to accomplish in her writings, in her speaking, in her challenging and not being afraid, I loved her moral courage to speak out when it was not popular, to stand and to withdraw her membership from the daughters of the American Revolution because they would not allow Marian Anderson to sing at Constitution Hall in 1939. So I'm uh, endeared to her her work and what she stands for. Awesome. Who's your least favorite first name? (laughs) I would say... I think Nancy Reagan. I found a mean spiritedness about her being spiteful. Um, I just struggled with a lot of the politics of both she and her husband and what was promoted during that period. A lot around the race, the struggles, the war on drugs and, and just decimation around the economics that hurt so many black people and others, other poor people, white and others, and just a kind of conservatism that moved our country into a place where we find ourselves today. It really starts with Ronald Reagan and a lot of people, you know, in, in his death, he's been hailed as this great person, but really the people who are out here today. And I think there are actually many who are worse, but they, they, they take their beginnings back to him. The Republican Party, there were many leaders in the Republican Party before he became president. They were concerned that if he ever got 
to places of power, that he was too conservative for the power, for the party and would lead the party down that road to an ultra conservatism that would cause much duress in this country. And I think we're seeing the Frankenstein today of what started with him and with her. Last first lady question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Who's the most underrated first lady? Mm. The first person who came to mind was Mary Todd Lincoln. I think she really gets um, probably the most, probably misunderstood and underrated. She had, she had problems and she would, ha- I think she had what we would see today as a lot of mental illness. And I think she had an emotional strain, but this is a woman who saw three of her four sons die before her and losing a child is so hard. And for her to go through that, just to see them die two very young and one older, but there was uh, that, I think that really weighed on her and caused a lot of her problems. I think she, and I think there were things she did that I really didn't like when I read her. But I think there are also things that she did that she's not given credit for, for her abolitionism. Uh, To be able to be from the South, from Kentucky, and to have her brothers, family members, fighting with the Confederacy, and to stand and to speak against slavery. And to have a Black woman who was a close friend of hers during that period. I think that part of her is not really raised. That she really did more to fight against the evils of slavery than people would give her credit for. And just uh, a number of things that she was able to do, her education for a woman of that time, being outspoken, I think those are things that she has not been rated, given her credit for. Uh, There are still struggles I have with her, uh, but I do think she's underrated in that way. Thank you so much for what a, just a rich conversation and um, just being the person you are in the world. <laughs> I feel so honored to be your friend and to um, know your your work, too. And if we're ever in Atlanta, we're going to come see you at St. Luke's. <laughs> oh, please do. Um, St. Luke's, so people who are interested in finding more about my work, you can Google me and, and Wikipedia has some information. It's it's limited. And I think there's a, at least one YouTube of me that's out there. Uh, but if you want to hear my sermons, they are cataloged on our website, St. Luke's Episcopal Church and St. Luke's Episcopal Church.org. There's a Facebook as well as there is a website. And you can just uh, do the drop down menu and you'll be able to find the sermons. And they since I've been at St. Luke's for almost two years now, the, my sermons are there uh, on a, a, a range of uh, topics around um, and theology, everything from what I've been talking about for the last hour to uh, gun violence and the uh, the problem of uh, idolatry of guns in our culture and uh, poverty, um, women's issues and women's equality particularly around the Brett Kavanaugh during that period, there's a sermon that's there, uh, as well as other theological issues, uh, social justice issues that God has laid on my heart. So you can go there and and find that information. And St. Luke's Episcopal Church uh, welcomes you. We really do live into our slogan that you find on the signs. The Episcopal Church welcomes you, and we really do welcome wherever you are, we say on your spiritual journey, St. Luke's welcomes you. So I hope that you will find a place there and continue to uh, support the book, uh, The Own Receive Them Not, because even though some of we've made some progress since the writing, we have moved on marriage equality, and I wrote this was prior to 2015, that becoming the law of the land. But there is still work to do. We have not uh, overcome. And often I think there is a feeling of we have done it. And I even find it with a lot of gays and lesbians who feel like the the struggle is over. But people are still losing their jobs. There are still attitudes. There are still families being torn apart. 
because of homophobia, still young people committing suicide, LGBTQ folks. It's the highest, six, some of the highest six times more likely than heterosexual youth to take their lives, many of them in places outside of urban centers where they don't have support groups. Uh, homelessness is a big problem among LGBT youth, teens. So this is the work that we still are being called to do in our ministry. It is part of being a faithful Christian in the same way that those who march with Martin Luther King, they saw it as their Christian witness. This is a Christian witness to stand with those who are marginalized, those LGBTQ folks who are out there suffering. And let me give a shout out to my good friends, Bonnie and Rajiv, who are the parents of a young gay man. And I have admired them over the years for the way they reared their two boys and their openness, that it was always okay for them to be how God had made them. And that message is so wonderful, so refreshing, but it is so often not present. So I am so happy for my play nephew, Nicola, <laughs> who ha- who has been blessed with these parents. I think more than he will ever know, because there are so many young folks who don't have that. So please do this work. It is a matter of life and death for so many. And we must be God's hands and eyes and mouth for the people here on our journey to be able to let them know that God loves them and that God is with them. So I hope that you will find a place in your heart to do this work with us, to do this ministry, to be a witness for those who are LGBTQ. And for those of you who are, if you're listening, know that you are loved. Mm -hmm. The beginning of Holy Scripture says that everything that God made was good and that you're good and always know that and know that you're never alone. There are others out here who are standing with you so that you will be able to live a beautiful life that God has given to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is a matter of life and death for so many. And those of you that are listening that identify as Christian, as progressive, as liberal, here are some great resources. Reverend Dr. Horace Griffin at St. Luke's, Luke's Episcopal Church has topical and biblically driven understandings that you can take to your families and your communities. So, so tune in to those sermons and those resources as well. You can find them all linked in our show notes. And that will do it for us this week. Subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. We are available on all major podcasting platforms. And while you're there, if your platform allows it, leave us a rating and or review. We are always looking for more and more ways to hear from you. So for this week, this is Rajiv. And I'm Bonnie. Thanks for joining the conversation.